Well, good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon at um, the OFS event, Next Steps in Access and Participation. Um, my name is Sarah Howells. I'm the Head of Access and Participation here at the OFS, and I'll be chairing the event for today and introducing the speakers. Um, I am very much aware that colleagues are still joining. We've had um, around 13 hundred registrations for the event today from over 600 organizations so it's going to take a little while um, for everybody to join us. Um, I have to say we're really delighted with the number of um, with the number of colleagues who have signed up for today's event and we've got people from a range of different organizations. Of course we have many many um, universities and college colleagues with us today and from a range of different areas of, of those institutions from the sort of senior management team to academic registrars, head, head of access and participation. We're also really pleased to welcome colleagues from um, other organisations such as charities, the Brilliant Club, um, the National Saturday Club, for example, and um, other of, of our partner bodies such as UCAS and Universities UK and a range of widening participation organisations. And very importantly, we're very pleased to welcome uh, representatives of the student body. So we have chief executives of student unions with us today, plus sabbatical officers and members of our own student panel. So welcome all and thank you very much for taking the time out to attend this event with us today. Um, the purpose of the event. Um, is to first and foremost introduce our new Director for Fair Access and Participation, John Blake. Um, and John will be setting out his vision um, for, for access and participation and how we move that forward um, into the future. Um, there will also be then an opportunity to hear from my colleague, Charlie Leyland, who's the Access and Participation Manager. And she will take you through a little bit about how those reforms will start to be implemented um, over the next year or so. And then there will be an opportunity to um, have a, a Q&A session at the end um, where you will be able to put questions to both John and Charlie, and they will be joined by our colleague, um, Matt Jones from our analytical department who can answer any questions related to, um, to data. I do have to say that obviously we do have some live consultations at the moment, um, but we will not be uh, taking questions on those issues. Um, we are only sort of going to be answering questions on the access and participation agenda set out today. If you do have an interest in questions related to those live consultations um, on the teaching excellence framework, the new approach to regulating student outcomes or constructing student outcome and experience indicators, um, then there are a number of other events that we are hosting. Um, the next of these is tomorrow, and there'll be further details of all of those events um, on the OFS website. So do please um, go and have a look at those if you have particular interest in those areas. So um, before we get started and I introduce you to John, just a few housekeeping notices. We have um, turned on live transcription feature in Zoom, so captions are available by clicking on the um, on the CC icon. I must say that these are automatically generated and so you may see some errors, some of which can sometimes be quite comical, um, but they, they, they will be available for you. The event is being recorded and will be available on the OFS website and we'll paste the web link to that in the chat um, later on. Please do submit your questions to the Q&A box rather than the chat box. The chat box is only there to talk to um, our, our colleagues at behind the scenes here if you have any technical issues. And do please post those questions throughout the presentations um, so that we can gather them up and I can put them to the panel um, in the final session later on. Um, so just by way of the agenda, um, the, uh, I, I, I'm going to introduce you now to um, John Blake, who is our relatively new um, Director for Fair Access and Participation, who joined the OFS in January 2022. Prior to joining the OFS, he was a senior leader and researcher in the school sector, leading on public affairs and curriculum research and design for ARC, policy and strategy for Now Teach and History Initial Teacher Education for the Harris Foundation. John has also worked as Head of Education and Social Reform for the Think Tank Policy Exchange, 
was a founder governor of Oak National Academy and served as an advisor to the government of reforms to initial teacher training and continuing professional development. So without further ado, John, it's over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Sarah said, my name is John Blake, and I joined the OFS just last month as Director for Fair Access and Participation. I'm delighted to know that so many people from across the HE sector are joining us today. We have over a thousand people watching this from across the country. It just shows how essential to higher education work on access and participation is, and how committed so many people are across the country to ensuring that students of all ages and from all backgrounds can expand their learning, enhancing their career and lives. We've called this event Next Steps on Access and Participation because although I am new to this role, of course, this agenda is not new. Much important work has already been undertaken and more is going on right now. Because of the work of the Office for Students on Access and Participation, we can quantify a huge amount of that work. Since the OFS was established, over 250 access and participation plans have been agreed, committing more than two and a half billion pounds over five years to supporting learners from underrepresented groups, to ensure those students both get into the higher education they need and want, and go on to the lives and careers they aspire to. That is down to the collective effort of the people who have joined us here today, from colleges and universities up and down the country. It is also down to the hard work and dedication of the staff of the OFS, who have in a few short years built a new regulator in a vibrant and changing sector, pursuing its strategic aims, notwithstanding the buffeting by political, economic, and lately pandemic shocks. In particular, I would like to acknowledge the huge contribution of my predecessor as Director for Fair Access and Participation, Chris Millwood, whose approach to building and monitoring access and participation has led to stretching and broad ranging targets being set by all providers, underpinned by demonstrably ambitious and strategic approaches to achieving those targets. Ambition is one of the OFS's core values and our access and participation work is clear proof of it. But learning and openness are also core to the OFS's work. So as well as being proud of where we've got to, the start of a new director's term also gives us a chance to review the past few years of the OFS's work and identify where we think we can do more. There are a few areas where we believe the AMP process could be better. We can do more to ensure good work on access leads to worthwhile participation. Talking to students from across the sector, especially those from disadvantaged and minority backgrounds, I've heard more often than I would like that students feel their providers fell over themselves to bring them into higher education, but interest in their needs trailed off the moment they were through the door. Our data makes clear these are not isolated experiences. Students from disadvantaged backgrounds have often overcome significant obstacles to get to university. It cannot be right that those students' entry to HE is used to polish the laurels of providers who are consistently and persistently not delivering on the quality of teaching and support those same students need to thrive in higher education and succeed after graduation. The APP process can do more to prevent this. We can make APPs more accessible. I've spent my career in education and sadly I'm no stranger to vision documents that are light on substance. You can't say that about the APPs, which is a good thing. It is obvious serious analysis has gone into them, driven by clear guidance from the OFS, but students and their families, schools and others in the education system, and other stakeholders, including say, new staff at the HE regulator, shouldn't have to read all of that to know what providers have committed to. The analysis needs to be done, but simple, straightforward outlining of commitments and how they will be delivered is needed too. We can do more to encourage providers to consider non-traditional pathways and modes of study. 
Degree apprenticeships have rightly expanded hugely since their inception, offering a high quality and increasingly high status route into education and employment. How we in the OFS can support providers to use degree apprenticeships and other non-traditional pathways is something we need to think more on. And we can consider more carefully our effects on smaller providers. It is right that we have a single regulatory framework for the whole HE sector. It ensures all providers can be held accountable on the same grounds and all students can feel confident their interests are protected. That is an immovable commitment of the whole OFS. But we know that smaller providers found the APP process more challenging. We need to ensure that our work helps them achieve their commitments and does not drain time, energy and money that should be going to supporting students. Of course, internal reflection is not the only reason to consider carefully where we are with our access and participation process. In the time since we first set up the APP regulation, new issues have emerged and some existing challenges have expanded. The first is a challenge where the sheer weight of evidence is now so strong, it is essential we give it more thought when considering access and success at our colleges and universities. The attainment gap between disadvantaged pupils and their peers opens almost as soon as they are born. It manifests in words learnt before children enter nursery, the speed of achieving fluency in reading in early primary, then vocabulary, numeracy, oracy and more in upper primary and secondary. And it is clear in statutory assessments and especially GCSE outcomes. And despite some clear and in remarkable cases uh, and remarkable cases of improvement in the quality of schooling in the past 20 years, that gap remains wide open throughout life. And of course, that affects who goes into higher education, which institutions they can attend, what support they will need, what academic outcomes they will achieve, and what lives and careers they go on to. If we are at all concerned with the quality of opportunity in accessing higher education, we must be concerned with improving attainment much, much earlier in life. Secondly, since the APP process was designed, the OFS has moved its thinking on in other areas also. Just last month, we launched the final consultations in a wide-ranging refresh of how we regulate quality. I encourage everyone to respond to those consultations and everyone should know that as we consider your feedback, our AMP work will be brought into firmer alignment with our approach to quality. Finally, we have lived through, are still living through, the greatest collective disruption since the Second World War. Global in scale and impact, the pandemic has demanded new ways of working, thinking, responding. In education, the pandemic has laid bare that which we already knew and made worse the problems we already faced. Those who live their lives in and at the edge of poverty faced too many barriers already. Lockdowns, job losses and digital divides have only made them worse. In schools, we know that disadvantaged students have suffered the hardest blows. Young people who in many cases already had the longest path to climb. In higher education, whilst we can point to some sudden successes, who knew that it was so easy to record lectures and allow students to review them afterwards? Certainly not those disabled students who campaigned so long for it and were told it was impossible. But we also have to face the fact that educational inequality is rarely made better by major disruptions. We will be living with the consequences of COVID for a generation or more. And we must be ready to adjust our work on access and participation to reflect that expanded challenge. To respond to these reflections and challenges, I have three key aspirations for my time as Director for Fair Access and Participation. The first is unapologetically nerdy. Evaluate, evaluate, evaluate. Everyone I have spoken to about this agrees that for 20 years or more of widening participation work, we have nowhere near 20 years worth of evidence about what works. 
We can't share what works and we can't make it work better if we don't actually know what does work. In schools over the past 10 years, the Education Endowment Foundation has transformed the use of evidence and the work schools do to add to the sum of knowledge about effective educational practice. It seems odd to say the least, that on something so crucial to the HE sector as access and participation, we have yet to match that. We have a What Work Centre in TESO, and some strong progress has been made, but the OFS and providers can and should do more. That means accepting that some interventions will fail, but so long as we are learning from those failures, then some good has still arisen. We are keen to explore the sandbox of regulation to give providers committed to generating robust evidence the space to do so. But we expect the projects committed to in APPs to be evaluated, for those evaluations to be independent, and for them to be published. My second aspiration is that our access and participation work will align with and be seen as a crucial part of the OFS's quality and standards work. It is not enough that learners from underrepresented groups can get into college and university. Access is about successful higher education, not just any higher education. Real and enduring social mobility via higher education requires qualifications which are valued by students, employers, and society. I absolutely reject any suggestion that there is a trade-off between access and quality. If providers believe the regulation of quality justifies reducing their openness to those from families and communities with less experience of higher education or who have traveled less common, often more demanding routes to reach them, they should be ashamed of themselves. They should also be under no illusion that every power the OFS has, including removing providers access to higher fees, will be deployed to ensure providers abide by their responsibility to improve access, participation, and quality. My third aspiration is to see more and more impactful school university partnership activity. The attainment gap opens early in life, so attempts to close it have to start then too. Some have asked why this is the business of universities. Aren't nurseries and schools, families and communities, local and national government supposed to sort this out? I could respond by saying that such attainment raising is in the direct interest of HE providers. More young people achieving more strongly means more potential students eligible to attend college and university and a greater chance of them succeeding. And no doubt that is true. But I think to say only that betrays a very impoverished view of the role and importance of higher education. HE is offered by cornerstone civic institutions. And while some providers have more international horizons than others, all of them have a locality, one that more often than not, they share their name with. Universities and colleges have a moral duty to put their shoulder to the wheel of improving that wider community they sit within. And as both educational and civic institutions, improving attainment in our schools is an essential part of that work. But they should not assume that this duty falls to them alone. Of course it doesn't. We are asking providers to seek out strategic, enduring, mutually beneficial partnerships with schools and with the third sector, all working together to contribute to this work. In April, the OFS will be hosting an event bringing together universities, schools, and the third sector to investigate current best practice and explore ways forward. No one is expecting universities to save schools. And school leaders and teachers would not be very happy to find that their colleagues in HE might think or talk about them in that way. But we are expecting providers to pull their weight on pre-16 attainment a challenge which affects us all. We will be generous in our expectations of the work providers undertake in this area. It may be expanding evidence-led, provenly successful interventions like Bournemouth University's work on literacy in primary schools. 
Their student ambassadors work with year six pupils through a 10 week reading program, which saw the reading ages of two thirds of the participants increase. It could be new thinking and tools for measuring and enhancing the knowledge and skills of disadvantaged pupils in subjects and year groups where we do not yet have coherent curricula matched with integrated informative assessment. It will almost certainly include both place-based policy initiatives tied closely to localities and more wide ranging regional and national initiatives. We are keen to see innovation and experimentation provided there is commitment to independent published evaluation. We know providers can do this work because a great many already are. Many more are no doubt doing similar activities without recording them in their APPs. Others will need time to expand their networks and build partnerships with groups of schools and successful third sector providers. But we also know that this work already massively important has been made more urgent by COVID. We also know that there is much excellent work already in the APPs, work which must carry on alongside these new efforts. For that reason, I am proposing a three-stage process which will carry us forward, ensuring momentum is sustained alongside opportunities to build networks, plan interventions, and commit to effective evaluation. The first stage is our monitoring of current access and participation work. My colleague, Charlie Leyland, will talk more about that in a moment. But for now, I'll just say that we will not be requiring a monitoring return from every provider. Instead, we'll be undertaking a risk-based review of the data we hold and following up with individual providers only where we have concerns. This will be a tangible reduction in regulatory burden for the many universities and colleges that are on track to achieve the targets they have set for themselves, and an incentive for others to make similar progress in future. In the second stage, we'll be asking providers to review their current APP and for them to seek variations to ensure the full scale of their work on strategic school engagement, quality, and non-traditional pathways is being captured. If such work is not currently happening or is not appropriate, providers should seek to remedy that too, with new action beginning from September 2023. And all providers will be asked to seek a variation so they can create an executive summary of their APP. This variation process, which we expect to begin before the summer and conclude before Christmas, will allow providers to discuss both new and changing areas of their work with us, whilst ensuring that the ambitious work already agreed can go on. It will also provide a great opportunity for engagement and learning ahead of the third stage of our plan. Building APPs on a longer term strategic basis has been a crucial change in our approach, and we intend to keep that. However, Given the unprecedented pace of change as a result of the pandemic, it seemed sensible to review those timescales. And with the role of director being appointed for four years at a time, it seemed sensible to bring the APP cycle into alignment. So subject to consultation, we intend to bring forward the access and participation plan cycle by one year. New APPs will begin from September 2024 and will run for up to four years. When we consult to update our guidance for that new cycle of APPs, we will include the lessons learned on strategic school engagement, quality, pathways and evaluation from our engagement with providers in stages one and two. We will also consult on changes to our key performance metrics to ensure they reflect all our priorities and give the right signals to the sector about the outcomes we are seeking. We will continue our reforms to reduce the burden of monitoring of APPs and consider using our enforcement tools in areas where providers are not meeting their commitments. We will also seek better ways to shine a spotlight on those achieving the most positive outcomes. And we will work closely with colleagues in small and specialist providers to ensure that our regulation of them is proportionate, 
effective and fair. This is a clear agenda built on the hard won successes already achieved by the OFS and the whole sector. It relies upon us in the OFS to be open, thoughtful and responsive to the sector's feedback and asks the sector to be bold, ambitious and responsible in developing its work on access and participation. I'm enormously excited about the potential and look forward to working with all of you and your colleagues across education to ensure that every student can access the higher education they want and need and go on to the lives and careers they deserve. Thank you. At this point, um, I'll now pass you over to my colleague, Charlie Leyland, uh, who will discuss uh, our monitoring processes uh, and the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, John, and hello, everyone. I'm Charlie Leyland. I'm the Access and Participation Plan Manager here at the Office for Students. So I'm going to outline how we will take this package of reforms forward, and I'm going to importantly explain what you're going to need to do and when. So this session will cover monitoring arrangements for the progress that you've made in the academic year of 2020 to 21 against your plans. I'm also going to cover how we'll support and enable uh, providers to make variations to your access and participation plans, and also outline the expected timeline for our engagement with you and other stakeholders on the development of our new access and participation plan cycle. I will be referring to various OFS guidance uh, and, and links uh, and related documents. Uh, this is all put together in a slide at the end of this presentation and you will be able to access these slides uh, either through a link in the chat, I believe my colleagues are putting that there now, um, or on our website later today. So here you can see a timeline for what will be happening over the next year in relation to the reforms. Before I kind of talk through this, the first thing to say is that underpinning all of this is our expectation and a condition of registration for those providers that are charging above the basic level of fees that universities and colleges will continue to deliver the commitments that they have set out in their approved access and participation plans. Um, we simply cannot afford to, to take our foot off the gas on all of the excellent work you've all been doing, uh, which is already le leading to improved outcomes for underrepresented groups. So just talking through the timeline here, you can see um, the timing for the monitoring of the progress made during 2020 to 21 there on the top row in gold. The timing for our mass variations exercise in the second row in blue and the timing for our stakeholder engagement on the future AMP plan cycle there in the third row in green. You can also see that the Director for Fair Access and Participation will decide whether or not to roll over your plans for 22-23 over to 23-24 as normal in the winter of this year. So that's normally between December of this year and February of next year. Actions that universities and colleges need to take are all there in the bottom half of the timeline in grey. So today I'm going to talk through all of this in more detail. I'll cover monitoring first, then variations, then stakeholder engagement, and at the end, a quick reminder of other AMP related milestones, which might be helpful for you. Okay, so first I'm going to talk through our plans for monitoring for this year. So we piloted our monitoring approach last year for 2019-20 plans. As you know, we required each university or college with an active AMP plan for 2019-20 to submit a return. We also considered an optional independent student submission. We now feel able to take an even more proportionate and targeted approach to monitoring the progress that you're making. So as John, uh, as John has just announced, uh, we'll be significantly reducing burden for those providers who are on track with the delivery of their AMP plan um, for the 2020-21 monitoring cycle. So just to be absolutely clear, we will not be expecting monitoring returns from, from providers for this year. And as such, we don't expect to see uh, independent student submissions either. So how will we do this? Um, we will complete a desk-based assessment of performance, looking at indicators in the access and participation uh, data set. We'll look at reportable events and other intelligence we hold, such as complaints. 
Um, these will all be used to identify early warning signs that there's an increased risk that a provider may not satisfy its ongoing conditions of registration. Now, regulatory decisions will not normally be, oh, can we just go back there? There we go, thank you. Um, so regulatory decisions will not normally be taken solely on the basis of these indicators, but they will identify areas for us to assess further. So where we consider that there's an increased risk of a future breach, or that there is or has been an actual breach, we may respond swiftly with interventions, which may include the use of our sanction powers as set out in the regulatory framework and regulatory advice notice 15. So we will make interventions in line with the regulatory framework, depending on the nature of the breach or risk. Um, so this could include applying specific conditions of registration, refusal of an AMP plan in future, or financial penalties. Next slide, please. Thank you. So <clears throat> as you can see here, our monitoring cycle will begin with the OFS ANP data dashboard update. This is currently scheduled for the end of March 2022, so shortly. We will notify one month in advance of the exact date of release as normal on our website in line with the requirements for official statistics. We will conduct our monitoring assessments following this update, so over the spring and summer of this year. And as normal, we expect you to publish a short impact report setting out your progress against your plans. And we will write to you to offer some further guidance on our expectations here in, in due course. Okay, next slide, please. So what do universities and colleges need to do? Well, firstly, it's a requirement of the statutory regulations that governing bodies monitor their plans. Providers need to consider their own performance against their 2020 to 21 AMP plans and more broadly for their students from underrepresented groups. You can do this by looking at the provider AMP data dashboard on our website. Um, but of course, you should also consider student feedback, internal data, and other uh, evaluation that you've conducted. Secondly, work with your students to understand your performance and to refine and evaluate your strategic measures um, to ensure effective delivery of financial support for all eligible students uh, as well. If we can see that you have not made sufficient progress in relation to your yearly targets, as you might expect, we may be in touch. Now, if we do contact you, we will want to understand why progress has been limited and what measures you are taking to get back on track, essentially. Finally, as I mentioned, um, we'll expect you as normal to publish that short impact report. Now, before I move on, we may have highlighted information to you in your A1 outcomes letter. So that is, um, casting your mind back, the letter we wrote to you on approval of your 2020 to 21 onwards AMP plan to help you focus your monitoring activities and reporting. So this information would have been detailed under Annex B, notice setting out issues that the OFS wishes to draw to your attention. So if this applies to you, you no longer need to provide us with further information or uh, an update on these commitments unless we explicitly ask you for it. So <clears throat> as with all conditions of registration, it's the responsibility of the governing body to ensure it complies with condition A1. We expect you to continue to deliver the provisions of any approved active a &P plan as set out in condition A1. Now, if you become aware of anything that could negatively affect your ability to comply with the condition, then you should consider whether you need to report this to us in line with our guidance on reportable events. Now, let me be clear. So non-delivery of a target or an aspect of your plan does not necessarily constitute a reportable event. The questions you will need to consider are whether or not you are taking reasonable steps to comply with the provisions and whether or not uh, the issue and your response to it may result in you not having a plan approved in the future. Um, so I'd like to remind you, as set out in Regulatory Notice 1, that providers are required to take all reasonable steps to comply with their plan and in line with the approach taken in other legal and regulatory contexts, we take the view that to some extent, this compliance standard is likely to require the provider to sacrifice commercial or monetary interests if needed. 
So if you'd like more information on reportable events, um, again, we've included a link to our advice on this later in the slides. Next slide, please. So um, I'm delighted to see students and their representative um, bodies, student unions here today. Um, our pilot last year demonstrated the strength of student-led evaluation of A&P plan progress, and we were bowled over by the level of engagement and insight and foresight, frankly, um, that we saw in the student submissions. Um, whilst it wouldn't be proportionate to expect a student submission this year in light of us not inviting provider submissions, um, we maintain the strong expectation that universities and colleges must work with their student bodies to design, deliver and submit variation requests for their A&P plans as necessary. Um, we encourage universities and colleges to engage with their students at every stage of the A&P plan, from drafting the plan through to delivery and monitoring it. And many A&P plans will set out the ways in which universities and colleges intend to do this, and students should hold them to account for what they've committed to in their plans. Wherever a student or a group of students has a concern about their university or college that they would like us to know about, they're always welcome to use our notifications process. So this process relates to our conditions of registration, including A1, which of course covers access and participation plans. So on to the exciting bit. So we are conducting a mass variations exercise to enable the sector to take account of and address the new priorities that John has just set out. Um, the intelligence about the activities that you're undertaking and plan to undertake in these areas uh, will really help us to develop our thinking on how we can best integrate this into our future guidance on A&P plans. We are strongly encouraging any provider with an active A&P plan that's expecting it to be rolled over for the year 2023 to 24 to submit a variation to their plan addressing the issues that we will set out in the advice. So this is likely to include strategic partnerships with school to raise attainment, improving the quality of provision for underrepresented students. So this is about demonstrating the links between A&P plans and our requirements on quality, developing non-traditional pathways and modes of study, the production of a two-page A&P plan executive summary using a template that we will provide for you to use if that's helpful, and finally your plans um, on the evaluation activity that John just outlined. So to support you on this, particularly the first, we are holding an insight event in April to explore the shared challenges and opportunities faced by schools, colleges, universities, and third sector organizations as we all work together to raise attainment and improve opportunities. Um, I can see that the link has now just popped up in the chat. Um, I would recommend signing up early to avoid disappointment. I think this is gonna be a really popular event. So please use that link and sign up. Um, okay, we can move on to the next slide, please, thanks. Um, so advice on these variations will be published in spring. The exact timings for submitting variations will be set out in that advice. But I can currently say that we are planning to assess variations during this summer and autumn. So of course, we'll need variations to be submitted before that point. Essentially, we will complete our assessments of variation requests in time for the Director for Fair Access and Participation's decision on whether or not to roll over your 22 to 23 plan to 23-24. Okay. So on to how we're going to develop all of this. So we will work with you and other key stakeholders to develop our approach to the future AMP plan cycle for 24, 25 onwards. Uh, and as John said there in his presentation, we may consult more formally, depending on the nature of the changes we wish to make following that engagement and the development, the development work with you. Okay, just moving on to the almost last slide. 
So here's a reminder of upcoming access and participation milestones, which might be handy. So as normal in the summer, we will ask you to submit financial information about your AMP expenditure uh, through the annual financial return. So guidance and further information about this will be issued to universities in spring 2022 or via the ESFA for colleges. The annual fee information process is due to take place in autumn 22. So at this point, you will need to provide us with information about the fees you wish to charge to new entrants for 23-24. Information again about exact timings and guidance will be made available this summer. Then the process for submitting a new AMP plan for 22-23 hasn't changed. So if this applies to you, if you are submitting a new plan for 22-23, then please submit your plans to us later this month by the deadline of the 28th of February. Now, if you don't have an AMP plan, but you would like one for 22-23 and 23-24, so for example, if you are undergoing registration, or changing fee category, then we will still assess your plan, but it may be approved for a shorter duration to align with the broader reforms. If you were expected to submit a new plan for 23-24, um, for example, we approved your plan for a shorter duration, um, then this may no longer be required. We may roll your 22 to 23 plan over for another year to bring this into alignment with the wider reforms and the new cycle, um, but we will write to you shortly to confirm arrangements and expectations if this applies to you. Finally, if at any time you wish to request additional variations to your plan for future students, then those provisions are as set out in the Higher Education and Research Act. They're always available to you and you can find more information about how to do that on our website. Okay, so I, I realised that was a lot of information to take in. Um, here are a set of links to further information about the things I've talked about today and an email address to contact us should you have any further questions after um, the next session. Um, there's a link to the slide pack in the chat so you can browse and review the recording of this whole event, um, which will be uh, available on our website. Um, so I think that's all from me. So all that remains is to say a huge thank you for your time and also to my team who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes to make all of this happen in the most effective way and in the student interest. Um, we're really looking forward to engaging with you shortly on your planned variations and to develop the future of access and participation plans together. So thanks again for your time and I will pass back over to Sarah now. Thank you, Charlie. Um, that was very, very good. And I think has given us all the information that we need, um, but we will now move into the Q&A session. So could I ask all of our panel members to um, turn their cameras on, but leave their microphones off, please. So if John and Matt could join Charlie, um, if you haven't already, because I haven't got my thing on. There we go, excellent. Um, Okay, so we've got a lot of questions coming in, um, colleagues, and I do have to say that clearly, given the number of participants we have, we, are, we'll, we won't be able to get to them all, but what we're trying to do is um, find the ones where we've got a lot on the similar themes, <clears throat> so that I can make sure that we can cover off as much as possible. So I'm going to make a start and, and dive straight, straight in with um, the first question to John. So um, the first question is that there's an agreement here that um, with, with the ambition to um, raise attainment um, within schools and, and definitely very welcome in the Northeast. Um, the concern around this remains with how difficult it can be to get schools, particularly those that require improvement, to engage. Teachers have so many other KPIs that take priority with curriculum changes and lost learning that their time is, is very stretched. Um, uh, and, and have you considered alignment with their regulators, such as Ofsted or DfE, to facilitate this engagement for the sector? Uh, yes, uh, yes and yes. I think that's absolutely right. 
Um, we are speaking with Ofsted about um, how best to ensure that schools understand the opportunity that I think is offered here. And I've had lots of conversations with um, colleagues that I know from my own time in the school sector. Um, I'm conscious that a number of providers have said, oh, we, we feel we've gone out to schools and they haven't always um, responded positively. I think a portion of that is, is something we need to, to work and we need providers to work through in sort of working out how best to provide the capacity for schools to think about that. I also genuinely think there are some cases where providers need to think about whether what they want to offer is what the, the schools actually need. And I think that's what I mean. We have a very key focus on attainment, but we're, we're, we're looking to be quite broad, um, ensuring that we're matching the, the resource capacity and capability of the HE providers with what it is that schools need. And some part of that will involve um, capacity building for uh, schools and for groups of schools um, and I think I talk a lot about groups of schools there's obviously um, academy trusts are, are, are one type of group of schools there are other groupings of schools and other ways of bringing them together and I think it's it's not just about thinking about the specific activities themselves one of the the things I think we want HE providers to think about is how they can um, they can convene and sustain that capacity over time. Thanks, John. Um, I think moving on to from sort of different types of schools and how they, they may be able to engage is a question regarding different types of higher education provider. So what are the expectations for art specialists, for example, dance and music institutions in regard to school engagement? Could you give examples of where these types of institutions might best engage with this objective? So I'm really keen to avoid um, you know, when I was in the school sector, there was the, the terrible burden of Ofsted once. And as soon as Ofsted said, people might think about doing this, suddenly everyone ran to do only that. So I don't want to be in the business of saying, OFS says you should definitely do this. So I think, again, I, we're, we're keen to have a broad conversation about how best to do that. Um, I think actually specialist institutions have a huge role here, precisely because they are specialist. You know, one of the areas which we know that schools really struggle with um, is access to specialist knowledge in um, uh, key areas of the curriculum. Um, there's been a you know a huge discussion uh, over the last 10 to 20 years about the role and, and place of creative arts within the schools. I've always been a huge believer in um, the power and importance of creative arts in schools. Um, but often I think there's a divergence between um, uh, the, 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 the resource and knowledge necessarily within schools. And that's part of the, the thing that we'd be looking for, for specialist providers to help um, uh, buoy up. A number of um, school trusts do have very, very high quality um, music programs, and they would be, I think, an excellent place for um, sort of creative specialist providers to think about starting that discussion. Um, Charlie, moving um, to the issue of monitoring for 2020-21, um, um, there's a question as to whether this, this very highly risk-based um, approach that we've adopted this year would continue into the future um, for future monitoring processes. Good question. Um, so we will be evaluating how it goes this year, ultimately. Um, we're always striving to achieve the right balance between a, a proportionate and risk-based approach and, and getting the information that we need. So we'll be carefully evaluating um, how far this approach um, kind of marries that expectation um, if it ends up that we, we need to follow up with lots of providers and we, we feel that actually it might have been um, simpler to require a short submission, then you know perhaps we, we would consider going back to that approach. Um, so I think we're, we're trying this out. We, we need to make sure we get sufficient information um, to be able to perform our regulatory functions and we'll evaluate um, the success of that after we've conducted the exercise. Thank you. Um, and just as a sort of follow up to that, will we also be looking at spending commitments? Yeah, good question. Um, so we will not only use the AMP data dashboard to look at progress against targets, but um, other intelligence that we hold. Um, as I said, this could include reportable events um, or complaints. Um, 
we do hold information about AMP expenditure, so it's possible that we may look to that where we have concerns around um, whether or not you've delivered and achieved the milestones against your targets. So um, it's possible. Thanks, Charlie. Um, Matt, there's there's a few questions on data particularly, um, and I just I think one of the key ones is when um, data from the graduate outcomes survey will be included in the A and P data dashboard. Yes, so our for our update in March this year, um, we will not be including data from the graduate outcomes, and there is good reason for that. Um, related to our upcoming consultations on quality and standards. Um, they include, um, so they set out proposals of how we intend to define a measure using the graduate outcome survey. Um, and so we are waiting for the conclusion of those consultations before we implement anything uh, in terms of progression related to graduate outcomes. Um, so we do realize that the data that we would be publishing in our March update will be based on relatively old information, but we will be updating that as soon as we can after the conclusion of our consultations. Right, and just while you're still there, Matt, um, in terms of polar, could you could you talk about the um, the future of polar as a measure? And, and it's, it's got, the question is as a measure of inequality, it, it's a measure of participation into higher education. I think we've always been clear about that, but but I guess the future of, of polar featuring um, uh, significantly in the AMP data set. So, yes, as, as Sarah mentioned, I think it's an important distinction of, of, of what polar is a measure of, a measure of underrepresentation rather than um, a measure of any disadvantage, also an area-based measure. Um, in terms of polar, um, we will not be um, updating polar as a measure going forward. Um, we have a new measure of underrepresentation um, called Tundra, which is a slightly different methodology. Um, which relies on uh, kind of tracking uh, pupils through their schools into, into higher education. For that reason, it's slightly different to Polar in terms of methodology, but that will be the, the, the measure that we'll be using in terms of area-based underrepresentation going forward. Thanks, Matt. Um, John, there's been a few questions around evaluation, um, and particularly, I think, um, wanting to understand what we mean by external evaluation. So um, questions around, are you suggesting that money should be spent on paying for external evaluation of, of A&P activities rather than on the activities themselves? Um, and is, is there is, is the preference that universities outsource their evaluations to other organisations to achieve this independence rather than make use of their in-house expertise? So I think in the first place, I think I'm prepared to defend absolutely unashamedly spending money on evaluation. It's incredibly important that we know how things work, whether they work, and we know how they make them better. And I think it is, um, there is no reason whatsoever not to put the money involved in this process towards that because we need to build the evidence base much much more strongly than we already have to ensure that you know we we, we can take all reasonable steps and know that people are taking the right steps um, and know that the huge amounts of, of of work and energy and effort that goes into widening participation work is having the effect that we want it to have we can't just rely on um you know our feelings for that we've got to be rigorous and i think we've got to spend money on that i think the question of independent evaluation, again, is one that I think we are open to discussion on. Um, I think I would like to see more into university evaluation. So universities doing one another's evaluation. I think our concern with internal, some, some aspects of internal evaluation is that, that, that they're insufficiently independent to really give us the, the quality of evidence that we need. But it's not a sort of fetishization of independence. It is a um, it's the quality of evidence that we are generating that is important and and we will look at that holistically I know there have been other questions about whether we're expecting um, every single aspect to, to, to receive the same level of evaluation again it's a holistic look at what it is you are committing to in in the plan and what would constitute um, 
a high quality um, piece of evaluation that the quality of the evidence that you will be generating um, and, and in particular the fact that, that that all of those outcomes would be published. I mean I've had a couple of conversations with people who said oh well this this thing doesn't work. It's like well, what do you mean that strategy doesn't work? So oh, we did it and we found it didn't work. So well, well where's your evaluation? So oh, we didn't publish it. Uh, you know it's it's no good <laughs> knowing these things if they're not out there. Um, but as I say I think the the it, it's it's independent and effective taken together to ensure that the evidence is high quality um, that doesn't mean every evaluation needs to be a randomized control trial um, you know in some cases we're a long way from having enough evidence to justify a randomized control trial in some of these cases but it needs to be building the evidence base over time um, and and it can't just be uh, a replication of things that have already been done and been found to be ineffective Um, a few questions have come in on the um, continued role of UniConnect in your vision, and so I wondered if you could say um, how you see UniConnect fitting with the, um, the reforms that you would like to see. So we are in the process at the moment of um, going out to the UniConnect partnerships to discuss how we um, uh, update and retool their mission uh, to ensure that they, they can do this work. We absolutely see them as a crucial uh, bridge between different parts uh, of the educational sector and we really want to draw on the expertise and knowledge they have um, to drive greater collaboration. I think um, I think collaboration is key for, for all aspects of this but particularly for the cross-educational phase working. Um, we don't want to see you know every provider just or, or everyone doing the same thing individually and thereby having much much less collective impact uh, and I think UniConnect has a really uh, really strong role in in helping bring um, both providers and and those who could benefit from their engagement together uh, and we will be looking for them to do that. Thank you. Um, Charlie there's there's some, a few questions that have come up regarding student feedback in terms of monitoring could you just clarify the expectations around student feedback for this round of monitoring and possibly where we might look to this in the future sure um, so as I have outlined because we're not accepting a provider submission or evaluation of their own progress against plans uh, it wouldn't be proportionate or, or sensible to accept a, a student submission. Um, however, as I said, we maintain the strong expectation that universities engage with their students on this. Um, this is absolutely vital. So universities can understand their performance better. Um, we expect this engagement to go right through from drafting of the plans through to delivery of the plans through to monitoring of the plans. Um, so we, we really expect um, universities and colleges to be to be engaging with their students here. Now, if students had a concern about their university or college and their progress against um, AMP plans, um, then the notifications process is always open um, to you to use. And there is a link to further information about that in the slide pack. Um, but this is this in no way reflects um, you know, we we absolutely believe that student engagement is is critical to excellent AMP plan delivery. Thanks, Charlie. I think what's really important to emphasize is that our approach to monitoring for this year, um, it's very deliberately been, been um, take, taking this very risk-based approach in part to provide the space that providers now need to, to respond to the priorities that John has outlined here this, today. Um, there's a few questions here, a couple of questions here, which I think are related, John, and, and probably for you, um, that, that when talking about outcomes being the focus, is it around the number of students from underrepresented groups that um, then access higher education um, and how this is improved? Or is the focus of the work more on actually the attainment, the impact on attainment pre-16? So, um, as I say, I think we will be looking for quite broad discussion about with particular projects what is the best way of doing it. but fundamentally the 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 a huge driver of poor access is poor attainment um and we we have to shift that dial and intervene much earlier and we you know we have to be cautious here not to engage 
uh, in a in a discourse that that makes it sound like um, you know we think these students are are failing if they're emerging out of schooling about these things because often that's not been their decision. But we equally have to acknowledge that if students are leaving school without the level of skill and knowledge necessary to access higher education fruitfully, then they have been failed and we need to help them. Um, and so I think it is, it, it's about ensuring that, you know, I mean, I used to say when I was training teachers that you, you are in the service of the young person the day they leave your care. So we want them to be capable of being the authors of their own lives. So if that means ultimately we raise entertainment and they choose not to go to university, I think, you know, for, for very valid and sensible reasons, um, I think that's fine. But I think at the moment we have a lot of young people who are trapped by um, outcomes derived from attainment choices that weren't their own. Um, and they, they can't make those choices freely. So I, I think it will be grounded very strongly in, in changing that attainment. It's not just about getting more students into any one institution or into all institutions. Of course, our access and participation work is still gonna be really interested in the admissions intake of all of the providers, but you know, they're, they're not precise, they don't connect uh, exactly. There's a sort of uh, a general duty on um, on raising attainment uh, and, and closing the attainment gap, um, and then a more specific duty on, on the particular students um, providers take. Thanks, John. And I think related to that was a question regarding um, targets. It noted that, that not a lot said about targets and plans um, within your within your presentation and what your view is in terms of the setting of targets and, and, and indeed existing targets. So I think targets are obviously enormously powerful for, for guiding action and providing clear measures and milestones, but we, we already have within the guidance and the law, this notion of, of all reasonable action. So we, you know, we, we are never slavishly to the point of if you, if you miss the target, then um, you're for it and that's the end of it. There's always a, a discussion around that. And I think we have to have the conversation about what, what are the appropriate targets. I think a lot of the targets we've set are important, ambitious, uh, I know that Chris, when he was in this role, um, you know, was really clear with a lot of providers, they needed to go further and be more ambitious, and we will be maintaining that level of ambition. Um, but ultimately, the targets are tools to do the work. They are not the work themselves. Thank you. Um, so another question here is around the focus on relationship with schools. Um, and the question here about what, what about relationships with um, other providers such as local colleges, alternative provision, adult education centres, are they part of this vision? Yeah, absolutely. I think I mean, there, there comes a point where you, your sentences just become massively too long if you start to talk about all the different ways in this which works. But I think um, when I'm talking about schools and the school sector, I, I'm, I, you know, ultimately it's about the students. It's about the people who are in the system and how best we can support them and how best we can show that we're having the most effective impact. Um, so yes, the, the whole piece is in there. I think there's a really interesting discussion to be had about where um, our colleagues in further education sit in this, because obviously some of them are um, uh, have APPs and will be uh, seeking to extend their APPs. Um, but also have a huge level of knowledge um, and experience of the local school system, how to work to work that. And one of the conversations we want to have um, as part of that discussion with smaller and specialist providers is, is how best we reflect the role of further education colleges um, as part of, of this bridge. Again, we want to be um, it, it, nuanced. You know, it, it needs to reflect the work that needs to be done for the young people rather than um, a diktat from me about precisely what job each bit should do but yes the the when I talk about schools I mean the totality of the school system and I would take that right back down to 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 nurseries and and uh, and other um non-compulsory provision as well if that's where um providers think they can make a, a real and provable difference then I think we'd be interested in hearing about how that will work um it's it, it, the whole piece needs to be examined Thank you. Um, a further question is in terms of the role of education departments within higher education providers. Um, many, many universities will have uh, education departments. And the question is, do you anticipate these could, pl could play a role in supporting attainment in schools and access and participation delivery and what that might look like? 
So I think that is an old, that's ultimately a decision for providers. I think obviously there's a lot, there's a repository of knowledge and experience in there. And I know that um, uh, to take somewhere that I know that I'm, I'm, I'm going fairly soon, I'm going up to Sheffield Hallam. I know that Sheffield Hallam's education department's taken a huge interest in um, the work that it does uh, more widely throughout the participation. I think that's entirely appropriate. But I, what I don't want, and what I think we will be very, very clear about, is that this isn't this isn't a, a job to be hived off to the education department and everyone else be like, right, no, that's what they do. This is um, a, a central strategic importance to providers, um, and they, um, you know, can draw on the expertise and learning from the education department, but they shouldn't assume. Um, that, that they are always the correct agent of doing this, and they certainly shouldn't be the only people doing it. Um, uh, but but I think obviously some of the you know some of the work that, that higher education providers do at the moment that most clearly supports the school system is things like training teachers. I was on the ITT um, market review, and it was a source of enormous sadness to me that when the reports we, we put out the final report and encouraged a, a, an increase in the quality. Um, and, and provision the market some of our most prominent universities threatened to, to, to just drop and walk away from teacher training um i i just think that's unconscionable like there there are really important roles here so i think it is it is part of of, of that work but it's certainly not all of it and it's not only and as i say i think it, it would certainly not only be the education department thank you um a more a broader question here, um, and, and this question has been asked in terms of how we would share best or effective practice on engaging students with planning, delivery and evaluation of the APP. But I think that there's a broader question about how the OFS will share effective practice um, that does come through from, from the, the, the increased evaluative activity more broadly um, over, over time. So if, if there's anything that you, you would want to say on that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's clearly essential that we are able to share this best practice. And I've talked about TESO, and we're already having some excellent conversations with them about ensuring that that pipeline of evidence that's being generated by providers and by others in the sector um, is being channeled through. So we've got a clear idea about what that evidence is, and there are ways of sharing it. We will be investigating um, ways that we can support that. But I think, I mean, it's important to say, I think, with lots of things, I think a little bit like with the UniConnect piece, there is work that OFS as the regulator can do, and we should do, and we will do. But fundamentally, the, the system is also the responsibility of the sector. And sharing that best practice, gathering from one another, being available to each other to share that, that best practice is something that providers also need to build through and within themselves and between themselves. And I think we are very happy to have some role in that, but it, it can't entirely fall on us. Um, and you know, we're very keen to encourage that, move it forward, provide our expertise where that's necessary. So we, we will absolutely have a role in that, but we will also expect providers as part of their collaboration to be identifying how they intend to share that best, share best practice. And I take it back, I think, to that point about um, inter-university evaluation. That not only provides value in terms of um, quality and reliability of the evaluation, there are also providers who will not have the capacity to do um, that evaluation necessarily, but, but others can do it for them, providing, you know, support, guidance uh, and feedback. It's, it's the networks and partnerships that are built up around this work that I think are also really powerful and important. One final question, and I do, I do want to put this in because I, I think it's important. Um, so, so thank you for sharing your vision, but notice that there was little mention of progression beyond HE, so in, into the labour market further study. Does this suggest a reduced focus in this area or that current arrangements in place are sufficient? Um, it certainly doesn't suggest a reduced focus. I think um, my point about when I talk about partnerships between school and university, it's not just I say, it's not just for them to get in it's also for them to get on and, and participation and progression are part of the same challenge um so we absolutely um expect to be engaged in uh, a lot of discussions about how providers are ensuring that people can move on into postgraduate study into the labor market and again i know in in the discussions around some of this people said oh well you're making you know universities responsible for the entire economy it's like i'm not but equally, universities are sizable civic entities in, in their local area. They, they have 
you know, convening power. They have their own um, uh, economic power. There are providers who, you know, sign contracts and insist that that um, those they sign the contracts with take some of their students on as apprenticeship apprentices. You know, there are there are ways and means of doing this, and I think, you know, the the, the one thing I, I really want to see, and I've been really heartened in a lot of the interactions I've had with providers and with provider representative groups so far has been that there has been very much the, the, you know, what can we do attitude rather than here are all the reasons we can't do it. You know, it's, uh, none of us here are stupid. We know these challenges are are sizable and, and, and some aspects of them are beyond any of our power, but that cannot be a reason not to do this work. And what we have to identify is the most effective ways we can make the best difference so that collectively we can begin to shift the dial in those areas where individually we, we wouldn't be able to. Um, so I think it, it absolutely is the case that ultimately we want all young people to have equal opportunity to, to achieve the outcomes that, that they want and need that are right for them. That won't always mean um, you know, a, a high status job, but we also have to be honest that that is why a lot of young people go to university that is what they're expecting and that's what their providers who have Im invited them in uh, and promised them this experience need to make sure that they are they are you know doing you know putting their shoulders to the wheel to make sure that the best possible outcomes for those students happen it, it can't be that students are experiencing wildly different outcomes from providers who, to the student's eye when they applied, were, were near identical. That just can't be right. So yes, it is absolutely essential that, that providers keep um, that focus on, on progression uh, and continuation. And aspects of the partnership work will need, will need to address that too. Great, thank you. And thank you, John. And thank you to the rest of, of our panel speakers today. Um, it's been a, a great event. Thank you very much for your um, questions, everybody. Now, we know that we haven't got to all of the questions um, and we will be going through them. And where there are real questions about what happens Im immediately and, and the process, we will we will be putting um, answers to those up on the website. Others will be, we'll be addressing as we go through this process of development over the next um, uh, weeks and, and months to come. So we will be... Um, looking at everything that you've posted today. So thank you very much for your engagement. Thank you to John, Charlie and, and Matt for the Q&A and for the presentations earlier. Thank you ever so much to the, to, the, um, to, the, to the colleagues behind the scenes here who have made this run so smoothly and have done so much preparation for it. Thank you so much for, for all of your efforts. It's been, um, it's, it's been greatly appreciated. Um, so thank you for your time today, colleagues, and um, we will undoubtedly be engaging with you again over the coming weeks and months. So um, have a great rest of your afternoon um, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks all. Bye bye.